Praise the Lord. Can I ask you to stand to your feet real quick and just pray with me? Uh, while you're sitting, I want to thank RCF for your hospitality, your kindness. Uh, Pastor Gilbert, in his stead and in his absence, thank you so much for inviting me. Lady Gilbert, wherever you are, thank you so much for telling stories about me. I was, I was bad, but I wasn't, well, yeah, I was bad. Never mind. <laughs> On behalf of the Connection Church, I thank you so much uh, for this invitation. Let's agree together in prayer, uh, and then we'll get into the word. Father God, we come in the name of Jesus under the leading and guiding of Holy Spirit. We come thanking you and praising you for this time in your presence. God, I pray now that we would encounter you this morning. Speak to every concern, every condition, and every issue in the room, God. Nourish us with the meat of your word. Feed us with the milk of your word, God. Speak to us. Bless us with the Shekinah glory, your tangible presence, God, touching each and every heart. God, we ask now, now that you would do with every way, with every distraction, every hindrance, anything that would prevent your word from going forth. We thank you, God, for allowing us to be receptive to all that the Holy Spirit wants to say. Do your best work in us. We thank you now for revelation, for application, for successful living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give the Lord a hand, praise. Amen. Amen. Oh. Oh, don't sit down just yet. Don't sit down just yet. Uh, I'm going to have you on your feet all day. So if you got on cute shoes, you might want to take them off. Um, so when, when, when you're texting and tweeting your friends that you're at church and they ask you how church is going, you can say, he had us on our feet. <laughs> Amen. This is a little preacher joke. Amen. Y'all all right? All right. Take a deep breath. The word's going to be good for you. Amen. Praise God. I want to uh, okay. see if you do me a quick favor. And, and turn around and look at that wall real quick. I want to talk this morning about shifting, about making adjustments, about turning, about you turning, about your ability to turn towards God when you hear him call to move from a place of disobedience to a place of obedience and a place of order. Some of us are living our lives this way with our backs to the Father. You can hear him, but you won't turn. You want better, but you won't turn. You can turn now towards me. Take your seats. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I want to talk about turning. Say with me, turning. turning. Say with me, you turning. Not too long ago, I was driving, um, and I put in the coordinates for where I was going. Most of you use uh, some type of MapQuest, Google Maps, or whatever system you use. And I was driving, and I was, had an idea of where I was going, but I wasn't exactly sure. So as, I, as I'm driving, I go past a couple of the streets where um, Betsy, that's what I call my GPS and my phone, Betsy, because she fusses a lot. Uh, she doesn't like the way I drive. And so as I pass a few of the streets, she, uh, she began to say, at the next available opportunity, make a U-turn. She wouldn't give me any other instructions, wouldn't give me any other advice but that. At the next available chance, make a U-turn. Then she began to tell me the streets I could turn on to get back on track to the direction I was supposed to be going. For the next five miles, I ignore her altogether and drive in the direction I want to go. Because I think I know where I'm going. You and I do the same thing with the Father. We tell God, uh, I think I know where I'm going. And you get angry because you keep asking and inquiring God, for wisdom, knowledge, understanding about your life. And he keeps telling you the same thing over and over and over. How many of you understand that? You praying, getting the same response. Fasting, getting the same response. People walking up to you with a word of affirmation and encouragement. You waiting for another word. It's the same thing. Week after week. Amen? You got to hear God beckoning you to U-turn. Let's go to the notes. U-turn. Say me, U-turn. Turn to your neighbor and tell him U-turn. You keep expecting different results, but you keep doing the same thing. Some of you have an attitude with God because some things in your life haven't shifted. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about somebody you know. 
mad at God because things won't change, but they don't want to do anything different. You got some people right now, they call week in and week out, and you pray for the exact same thing every week. And sometimes you don't even pray. You just say, would you just do something different? When are you going to turn? When are you going to change? That's the same thing the Father's asking you. You say me, you turn. Say me, you turn. We all have to learn how to make some U-turns to backtrack. Y'all all right? Uh, see, I knew I'd lose a couple of y'all. y'all, y'all, y'all you're thinking about the turns you need to make. Some of you are living sub, sub, uh, uh, subconsciously where you don't even know how you got where you got. Have you ever done that before where you got home and you don't know how you got there? Pulling the driveway, you don't remember none of the turns? You living on autopilot? Oh, I'm going to let it work its way around the room. I came for a couple of mean mugs and some cold stairs. It don't even bother me. It behoove you to smile. Then that way nobody knows I'm talking about you. Say me, I got to make some adjustments. I'm going to take you to the text, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. When you have it, say amen. These screens are huge. Wow. Y'all there yet? Amen. Second Chronicles 7, 14, I'm bringing the ESV. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This is a very familiar passage of scripture. I don't want you to allow it just to be familiar. I need you to listen to it with fresh ears. The background or historicity of this particular text tells us that in chapter 6, Solomon just gets done dedicating the temple and has this conversation with the Father and offers up a number of scenarios to God and says, if, they, if, if the people do this, God, will you hear from this place? He tells God, he says, I know that there's no place on earth that can contain you, and I've built this place for you, and I want you to make this your resting place here in the earth. And in doing so, I want to be able to call on you at any given time and you respond to this place. So he gives scenarios, God, if, if we sin, will you hear us from this place? If there's famine, would you hear us from this place? If we lose war, would you hear us from this place? Say me, would you hear us from this place? He goes as far as say, God, if one of us is in war and we get carried off and we pray towards this place, would you hear us from wherever we are and move from this place. I love that extension because he could have just said, God, everything around this place be blessed. But he said, just in case I'm too far away to get here, can I have remote access to your power, to your presence for my life? He, he's doing all of this because he knows they're going to blow it. How many of you ever set some stuff up because you know you're going to blow it? He has this whole dialogue with the Father and says, just in case, God, will you always hear from this place? After that, they move right into a place of, of worship and dedication and giving offerings. And later on that evening, while Solomon is resting, God comes in and says, I heard your request. I heard your plea. And his response is this. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, heal their land. I will hear. Now notice his whole request is, God, I need you to hear. He said, we built this whole place and are designating it to worshiping, honoring you so that you would do one thing, that you would hear. Is there a place in your life that you've dedicated to God where he can be heard? Have you created a space where you and God can commune ongoing? Or are you just kind of talking to him in the hustle and bustle of life in between? Okay, let me, let me help you. He's asking God if, if, if anything goes wrong, won't you move for us? And I'll dedicate constant space to communicate with you. So God's response is, yes, I'll hear you. Oh, you got to hear that part. Even in your distressing times, I'll hear you. 
When you need me the most, I'll hear you. And if I hear you, I will respond. Some of us are, are angry with God because you think he's not responding, but you're not talking to him. I just asked, did you have a dedicated space to talk to him, or are you just kind of talking to him in between? Let's be honest. I'm, you know, I, when I'm in the bathroom, we'd have a conversation. Maybe on the way to work. Carve out some time for it. There has to be a dedicated time and space that you give to communicating with him, talking to him, and then being quiet enough to let him respond. And when he goes through the whole list, he said, no matter what, Solomon, everything you listed, if they're in distress, if they're hurt, if they're sinning, if they're uh, too far away, I'll always hear. But they got to do these things. Let's look at the, 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 what he says. He says, if my people who are called by my name will what humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and here's the turn. Say me, turn. This is the U-turn from their wicked ways, then I would hear. A lot of us want, don't want to turn, but we want God to hear. Jesus is, uh, good God. God is saying in plain sight, I want you to repent for your behavior. And if you can repent for your behavior, then you'll have my attention and then we can talk. Because it makes no sense to give instructions to people who aren't listening. Okay, let's go. Let me give you just the, the opening. Repentance is the process that gives us access to God, established by the Father himself as an essential component to our relationship with him, allowing us to encounter his grace, his mercy, and his glory. The moment I turn, the moment I begin to participate in the repentant process, I access the mercy and the grace of God, thereby accessing the glory of God. The glory of God is when he comes on the scene. Some of you love grace, some of you love mercy, some of you will never experience glory because you're not willing to do what it takes to get the glory. Grace and mercy. Matter of fact, one of the biggest messages inside of Christendom right now is grace, 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 grace. No accountability. Nobody being challenged to change. Just skating on the grace of God. Cheap grace. You cheapen it because you don't want to do anything different. Grace uh, and mercy. We sing about it. Mercy is for the miserable. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. So every morning I get mercy to get up and do it all over again. Or I can change. But some of us are so miserable we don't do anything different so we just get mercy. How many of you want more than grace and mercy? How many of you want more than just to say I'm living on grace? Bible except for the grace of God, there go I. Uh -uh. God has empowered me to live right and to change and to turn, and I'm going to do just that every time I wake up. Every time I'm talking to God, I'm not talking to God about doing for me. I'm asking God to empower me to do better, to be inside of his will, so that I can experience more than just grace and mercy. I want glory. I want abundance. I want overflow. You know what that looks like? When glory hits this place, nothing can move. When glory hits this place, it shifts the entire atmosphere. I want a shifting in my life that only comes by me turning, not me clinging to grace and mercy. Grace and mercy are the stair steps. And some of you will only live on the steps by choice. The pastor will stand up every week and beg you to believe God for more. Please. Even God is frustrated with you just being okay with kind of making it. And the enemy says, yeah, go ahead, don't believe God for more. Live beneath your means. Live from pillar to post. Trying to make a dollar out of a dime and a nickel. Who am I talking to? There's just a few of y'all in the room, be honest with me. How many are you willing to make a turn? Willing to make a significant change based on the repentant process that God offers here. And he says, if you move, just like that. See? Y'all breathe. You want me to do it again because you didn't, you didn't see that one coming? If you move, I move. Okay, see? Y'all, tough crowd, tough crowd. Amen. 
you're theologically astute, I understand that. I, I got all that, but some of that don't mean nothing if you're not going to change. I can give you a bunch of theological words, and a whole bunch of construct behind it, but if you're not going to go home and change, what is it for? I'm here to challenge you to be better, to do more, because there's, there's so much potential on the inside of you that's dormant that you don't really want to be tapped because it, 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 it costs too much to try. Okay, let's go to my notes so we can get on so I can get y'all home. Um, but for those of you who came for the glory, because see, here's what, I don't need glory here. I need glory at work. I, I appreciate this. This is overflow. This is called gravy glory here when I get glory with you. I need glory when she's mad at me at the house. Because I need a shift, amen? I need glory at work when they're talking crazy. And I need glory when I'm getting ready to do something absolutely stupid. And even they ain't even another word for it. It's just stupid. And you know what Forrest said. Stupid is as? Stay with me. Stay with me. How many need glory at the house right now? I mean, if glory showed up, everything would be different. Glory at the house, glory in your wallet. I need God to show up and be God in such a magnificent way. The only way to explain it is that God did it. Oh, come on. How many hungry people I got? I mean, God, I need you to do this for me. You showed up, God. You drove here, God. If you don't do something, I'm going to do something. How many of you ever threatened God like that? If you don't do something, I'm going to do something. God, if you don't do something, I'm going to do something. You ain't going to like what I'm going to do. You know what that's called? It's called a temper tantrum. Because you can't get your way, but you don't want to comply. Say it with me. No more pouting. I must comply. Say me, repent. Let's look at it. Repentance, number one, is a change of mind. Say it me. It's a change of mind. Most people say it's a change of heart, but the only way my heart can change is if my mind changes first. Change is fueled by passion. Passion is fueled by understanding. The things I'm passionate about, I understand. Passionate about my wife because I understand her sometimes. Passionate about my job because I understand what's going on. Your hobbies, the thing you're passionate about, you put more time into. So God says, I got to work through your mind to help change your circumstance. Because the way you see it and the way he views it aren't the same. So in some areas of your life, you don't think you need to repent. You're good. Here's why you think it's good, because ain't nothing stopped. You're still breathing. Car's still running. Kids ain't left. Everything all right. But when God should, lets you see it from his vantage point, everything's upside down. So then you have to be willing to let God transform your mind. Okay. I beseech you, brethren, for the, by the mercies of God, that you would present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your... Reason. Be not conformed to this world, but be what? By the renewing of your mind. You know the text. Let me see you do it. Come on, God. Don't talk to my heart. Talk to my mind. We sing songs, God, I want to be a better Christian. Where? In my, in my heart. Why? My heart is not always the issue. My mind is the problem. So I got to learn to serve God with my mind. So, so a lot of us have to be okay with the repentant process working first in our mind. So say it with me, God, God, change the way I think, change the way I process, you know you could change everything right now if you just thought about it differently. You could. That's why, you know who gets paid the most? People who solve problems. So then what happens when there's a problem? They bring in the thinkers not the feelers. Because your feelings have lied to you too many times. Some of you are hooked on a feeling. Okay. Stare at me all you want to. It's the truth. You're hooked on a feeling right now. How many of you right now are mad at your feelings because your feelings lied to you? You didn't take the time to assess the situation, to, to gain enough information, to, to find the data, and you made a decision based on your feelings. Now you find yourself repenting. 
Your feelings will lie to you. Your feelings make you think that your past is better than your present. Okay. You want me to mess with it? I mess with it because you're looking at me crazy. Here's what happens. You ever thought about somebody from your past and then you see them in the present and go, they're not as cute as I thought they were? Okay. I figured I'd find a few of you who, who's, who, you ever revisited a place from your past and said, it's smaller than I remember. Your feelings lie to you. So when you're dealing with God as an intellectual person, Asking God for information to change. Amen? Y'all all all right? God, I need more information. I need you to fully persuade me to make a U-turn. And if you look at Scripture, anytime God dealt with anybody, he dealt with them based on, um, on, on their minds. He spoke to them at their level of understanding, at their capacity. Competency. You good? I thought you'd be. Let's go. Number two. Say me repentance. It's all about making u turn. And see, when you see it that way, you don't see it as this groveling process, because that's not what it is. It's about, re- it's about changing. Here's how it works. If you offend me, and, and, or if I offend you, and the first person to say I'm sorry wins. Oh, y'all don't see it that way, huh? That's countercultural. You what? You better say sorry to me. What, or, or my favorite one, when I watch husband and wives argue, she says, well, what you sorry for? Don't ask him that. He don't even know. (laughs) He knows something is wrong. Every husband in the room, nod at me. Just nod at me. Yes. Yes. Don't ask me what's wrong. I I don't know what I did. I did a lot. I've been married 19 years. I never know what I did wrong. I walk in, I'm sorry. Because I understand how it levels the playing field. It sets everything right. It makes everything whole again. And she's smart enough not not to ask me what for. She just says, thank you. You see how quickly that level of response works in the natural between you and I? How quickly do you think it would work in terms of spiritual things that relates to God? It resets everything. Say me, repentance. Resets everything. Here's what what Solomon really wanted. He understood that God does visitation. He didn't want visitation. He wanted God to inhabit. And he understood that once God told him how, he would never ask God for visitation again, but he would repent so God would have habitation. How many of you are in that that season of your life where you don't need visitation from God? I need you to stay. I, all these pop-in and drop-ins. Every time you leave, something get broke. Just stay here with me, Jesus. Y'all all right? Come on, God, save me. Say, stay with me, Jesus. Just, just stay. And here's the thing. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And here's what I understand. If something is out of order, something dysfunctional, it's not God's fault. It's my fault. So if you're waiting on an apology from heaven, you're going to die waiting. Number two, save me penance. Penance is connected to regret, self-punishment with no change in behavior, meaning some of us will operate in penance and not repentance, meaning I will beat myself up but never really change. I'll rehearse behavior and talk bad about myself and beat the steering wheel all the way home. Why did I do that? I'm going to do it again. (laughs) You stand in the mirror, what's wrong with you? You don't even know. And you have no intention of changing. You will be confronted with evidence to change, the reasons to change, the ways to change, and will still not change. You will operate in penance over and over and again, and then have the nerve to call it repentance. You'll say, I'm sorry, and that's really all it is. Sorry. Repentance is acknowledgement of wrong and a request for help from God with the intent to change. Take notes, write it down. So that you know what you're doing. Matter of fact, some of you don't even have to write it down. You already know which one you're operating the most. Penance is, is really connected to making excuses. And some of us are really good at making excuses. I mean, some of y'all got some of the coldest excuses I've ever heard. 
You ever make up an excuse that's really connected to a lie, and then you start believing it? <laughs> We're talking about real life, right? So you, you lie to God all the time. God be like, why? You be like, well, you know, see what happened was, and then God, and then if she hadn't did what she did, Say me, no more excuses. The moment I, I, I'm open to taking ownership, we can move forward. Some of your relationships, some of your dreams, some of your hopes are stalled because you don't want to take ownership. It's working its way around the room. I see it. Say me, ownership, accountability. These are the things that make uh, our relationship with other people and God sweet. They never stall out if there's accountability. Say me, intent to change. Some of the things you bring up or don't bring up, for that matter, because you have no intent on changing. So why talk about stuff that's not going to get fixed? You ever, have a, you ever start a conversation with somebody and they, they change the subject real quick? Because they have no intent on changing any of that. Spending habits. Oh, you want me to work that list? Or just, just say amen and I'll keep moving. Cause, okay, okay, I'll stay here. Spending habits, the lack of a budget. No tithing. God robbing. No savings, no insurance. But you shift the conversation. Because you have no intent on changing any of that. As a matter of fact, get mad if pastors are talking about your money. I'd pass it down the street. I'd be all right next week. Because I talk just like this to them. Because it's my job to tell you to be accountable to God for your stuff. And stop playing like you are when you're not. Now, you want to talk to God about real change? It requires real, real repentance with every intent to go home and do something different. Go home and forgive that person. Oh. Dirty word, forgiveness. Because I like having a grudge. I bust the windows out your car. Y'all making me work too hard. Come on. Yeah. Because I got a grudge. Got a reason to be mad. What? Let go for what, God? No. You tell them to come apologize. You have to be countercultural. Be willing to say, God, yes, whatever you say, I'll forgive, I'll release, I'll let go. I'll, I'll change. Come on, say, man, I'll change, God. You too busy waiting for everybody else to change. How much time do I have? Okay. Y'all all right? Some of you don't do well with change. Change is good. Change is the price of progress. Everybody wants progress, but nobody wants to pay the price. You good? How many want change? Come on. There's every hand in the If you don't want change for you, you want change for somebody else. <laughs> it all is a process of repentance. I'm trying to encourage you to, to be focused on what God wants to do. Let's go. Number three, outward actions demonstrate and reinforce inward attitudes and belief. So it's not what you tell me, it's what you show me. Some of y'all from the show me state. Talk is cheap. I need a little bit of attitude, like you mad at the enemy for robbing you for years of your life because you've been making excuses. And you tired of just talking a good game, you actually want to be what you cast yourself to be in front of other people. How many of you actually want to be that stuff? No? No? Let's be honest. How many of you don't really want to be any of that stuff? You just, you just like talking. God says the same thing. I don't want to see you tell me what you want to be. I want you to show me what you want to be. The same thing you demand out of every other relationship in your life. You demand other people to show you. Don't just keep telling me you love me. I, how I know? Right. 
How do I know? You keep telling me. You telling me this? You telling me that? Y'all not as holy as I thought y'all was. Y'all know some stuff, don't y'all? I could take y'all all through some R&B and hip hop all day long. Y'all just y'all would nod and sing, yeah. I turn into Rufus and Shaka right here. Tell me something. See, because that's all you want to hear is something good. You don't want to hear nothing true. Nothing honest. I mean, just let's go. So, stop acting like that and you'll get better results, okay? Let's go. Let me get you out of here. Let's go to the next slide. The process, because that's what y'all really want, is you want the answer so I can go away. I'm, inside of the repentance process, you have to be comfortable with silence. Some of you, and me included, I struggle with quiet. The Bible says study to be quiet, study to be silent. It means you got to practice it. It means shut up. Turn off your phone. Stop being distracted. Inside of this turning process, you're going to see God ask you to do the same thing, to be focused. There's four things that he highlights in terms of what's necessary for him to to move. You ready? Number one, to humble yourself. Good Lord. The whole room got quiet. I mean, I saw all of you take a deep breath because all of us have different viewpoints of what humbleness is. Some of you don't like humble because you were humble and were taken advantage of, so now you equate humbleness to being weak. And in other words, you made a declaration, I will never be weak again. Just nod at me. Just nod at me. Because some stuff, some people don't even know about you. You don't know how to be humble because you see it as a sign of weakness. So then you struggle with it, not with just with people, but with God. And God is simply asking you to humble yourself. Humble yourself in, in, in this particular, particular Hebrew or Hebraic background means to take a knee, to bow. The other side of the definition, it means to deny yourself. To be okay with letting it be God's way. And not your way. Thank you, sis. Because some of you only like it your way. You wish that it was Burger King here all the time and don't care nothing about what God wants. I want my way. How many are you willing to deny yourself? How many of you understand that it's a process? It's not overnight. Because you've, you've built your life around doing things. I'm not fussing at you. I'm encouraging. I'm just highlighting some stuff that you already know about you. So that you can go home and change you. The best person that knows you is who? So why are you acting all surprised? Say when me pray. Second thing, God says, I need you to humble yourself, to take a knee, to deny yourself and pray. And it's during this process where I ask God for not my will, but his will to be done. Where I forfeit everything I'm feeling and ask God to override my feelings and make stuff happen to make me stronger, better, and faster. To bring peace to the chaotic portions of my life. To bring solution to everything that's bothering me. That's what I'm asking God for. Would you agree? Some of you drove here, God, just give me peace. You don't want nothing else. You don't want no cars. You don't want no money. You don't want nobody else. You don't like people. <laughs> you don't want a promotion. Just peace. Here's what, one of the things that I love about the, the definition for prayer in the Hebrew. It says, God, I need an extension from you to me. So anytime I find myself praying, I'm reaching out to God for a lifeline, asking God that he would extend himself from heaven to earth to make a a way out of no way. How many need an extension? Okay. See, you're looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about extensions. Like an extension cord, like it won't reach. God, I need an extension. You're going to make me do it. I need a girl with extensions in her hair. Bamboo earrings, at least two pairs. 
You asked for it. Cindy bag and a bad attitude. You say, girl, God, I need you to take what's there and make it longer. God, I need you to take what I have and extend it beyond my immediate means. Are you hearing me? When I'm on my knees asking God, I'm asking God to stretch the resources that I have to make them meet the need I don't. Are you with me? But pride says, I got this. You asked for it, I gave it to you. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. Little LL Cool J ain't never hurt nobody. You'll be all right. As long as you get the principle that I need an extension. Say to me, God, I need an extension. God, I need you to move heaven and earth so that I can reach my potential. Because I keep coming up short. God, I need help to turn. Come on, I want to turn. How many of you want to change, but don't know how? Some, here's, here's my, my concern. I want to change, but God, I'm so invested in this direction right now. If I turn, it'll ruin everything. These people don't even know me, God. If I turn, the fear of turning requires the prayer and request for the extension, the grace, period, to turn. Amen? How many of you going to ask God for some help? God, I need an extension. Y'all all right? Let's go. Let's go. The next one, seek. Say me, seek. Seek to desire, to inquire, to get information. I need, God says, I need you to seek me. He said, I'm not moving, you're just not looking at me. Okay, let me explain. It's too hard to change looking at the thing I'm trying to turn away from. So if you come to my church, I'll teach you like this. It's too hard for me to diet when I love chocolate cake. And all I look at is chocolate cake. Okay? I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what my wife says. I will not turn if we keep purchasing and stocking the house with Okay. Now, whatever yours is, is yours. Mine is chocolate. So don't judge me. I see you looking at me with a little judgment in your face. Don't look at me that way. Okay. Don't do it. The Bible says judgment is wrong. Judge not, at least you be judged. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. It's too hard to change staring at the thing that has my attention while hearing the call of God behind me. So I can hear God's clarion call to change, but I'm too focused on the thing that I'm looking at. With all the evidence needed to change, I still won't change. What's your thing? Why won't you turn? Why won't you break up with the person you need to break up with? Oh, because y'all touching, and, and you like touching, and um, <laughs> it's too hard to change. Look, I'm, 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 y'all grown, y'all grown. And you, you, you won't leave the job you know you need to leave because you're comfortable. I got a list of them. You want me? Some of those ain't even yours, they mine. <laughs> I'm too invested, God. You know how much time I put into this thing? Some of you feel robbed by some stuff, so you won't give up on it. So you keep praying, God, come on, God, make it work here. And God says, no, it won't work there. Move here. It won't work here. Move there. And you say, no, then, then you do this, you dig in. Some of you are going to die digging in. Why? Because it's too hard to change. Well, I'm focused on the wrong thing. Let's go. Sammy, turn. We're just talking about what God wants. But you see the progressive process by which he operates to get you to turn? The succession in it? The success in it? If you can do all these, didn't you get to the turn? And the turning ain't even hard because turning means I let go of anything and anybody who is not progressively concerned about me being better. There's some people in your life who only knew you when. They don't know, they're not prepared for your next. So those of you who are single, you can't ask God for somebody now. You got to ask somebody who can handle next. Yeah. 
Because now, because some, some people can handle you now. They don't even know what next looks like. And some of the people are with you now, and they wish they, they never got on board. And there's some people who are on board right now. You want to kick off because everybody can't go. I let it work its way around the room because I can sense the Spirit of God saying, I've been telling you to break up with that mindset, that person, that relationship for years, and you won't let go. And they're draining you of time and resources and energy. And you keep saying, God, no. If I don't pray for him, God, who will? God said, I'll send somebody else. Matter of fact, you in the way. Okay. Yeah, go, go ahead. Give God a hand praise because some of you are in the way. Go ahead. Bless him. Go ahead. If you would move some stuff out of the way, God said, I've been waiting to replace that for years. It's too hard to accept a blessing when your hands are full of junk. Let's go. Okay. All right. So, so. Which one are we on? Turn, okay. Just making, just making sure. Y'all with me? Stand to your feet. Turn back. I want you to face the wall again. Now, I've laid out all of the evidence and reasoning to turn, all the fact that God is going to send help to turn, all of the fact that you should be focused on turning. And some of you never will. Some of you will never experience the glory of God. And the glory of God is to be in the face of God. Some of you will live with your back to the Father for forever and only hear about blessings and never see any of them. I don't want you to live that way. I want to encourage you to change, to make the U-turn. Here's the thing, it's never too late. And whatever you have to pay to turn, whatever the cost may be, whatever relationship is at stake, whatever amount of money or time, it'll be well worth it to see the face of God, to experience the glory of God. Can't you hear God saying, you turn. At the next immediate uh, street, make a U-turn. Wake up this morning and make a U-turn. Quit asking God to change the circumstances. U-turn. Quit asking God to fix it. Quit asking God for more money so you can do more wrong with it. You change. You turn. Come on, turn. You can turn around now. Yeah. So lift your hands. I'm going to pray for you. Then the first lady's going to come and she's going to uh, take care of the altar work. But I want to encourage you to be better than what you are right now. I want you to leave this place examining and analyzing everything in your life that's not producing anything. Be willing to let it go. Be willing to let them go. Lift your hands, I want to pray for you. And this is a universal message because everybody has something they need to turn from. Everybody has some direction that you're going that you even know is the wrong way. But you won't turn. I want to encourage you. God says if you turn, I'll hear from heaven and change everything. Yeah. Hear me. He said if you turn, I'll change everything. If you participate in prayer and humbling yourselves, laying prostrate before me, if you change, I'd be so bold to even open up the altar for some of you need to actually change your position right now. The posture of repentance will change everything. How many of you be willing to change? First lady, can I have permission? Come on, those of you who need to move, come on. You can move. You can move. You've been stuck. Not sure. Need some help. How many need some help? God, I just need some help. Come on, I want to pray for all of those people who just need some help. Got every intention on changing, every reason to change. Just need a little nudge to change. How many of you know somebody who's not in this room that you want to intercede for, for their time to change? Come on, come on, stand in their stead. I want to pray for them too. Because the day going to call you tomorrow. 
here's the, the, the upside of you, you turning. If you turn, you become the example for somebody else to turn. Yes, God. I want to be the example, God, where you use my life to show somebody else that they don't have to live this way. Who's that? God used me so I can prove that you are real. We don't have to live this way. I pray for you then, First Lady will come. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for all those who are at the altar, at the place of transition and change. God, that you would do just that, that you would begin to alter our perceptions to see how you see, to adjust, God, to appease you, God, with our entire lives. God, we humble ourselves. We seek your face. We turn, God, from the distractions that have kept us locked into grace and mercy and held us back from the abundance of relationship with you. Father, now pour out your spirit, empower your people, cause us to be better as we turn to you. We give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor in Jesus' name.